There's an enormous need for financial solutions that are independent of corruption. Probably one of the most exciting to me is the ability to use the payment networks to do peer-to-peer -peer payments. And the most important application for that is global remittances. Global remittances represent a $510 billion market where migrant workers resident here in the U.S., in northern Europe, and in other rich countries send $510 billion a year home to, the, to their own countries and their own families. And this money goes to fund entire communities and extended families in the poorest nations on the world, in the world. Today, Western Union and companies like that extract $74 billion in fees from those flows of money. And they do it in the most exploitative and corrupt manner possible by charging the highest interest rates to send money to the poorest countries in the world. So even as the, the developed world is providing $150 billion in direct foreign aid to the developing world, that foreign aid is going to the top of the pyramid in these developing countries. And we hope eventually trickles down to the bottom, and we're stealing $74 billion from the bottom of the pyramid. If we solve this problem, we can re-inject that money that will transform communities around the world. Bitcoin has the ability in the remittances market alone to redirect $74 billion into sanitation, clean water, food in the poorest countries in the world. And this is not our money. This is their money and allowing them to keep more of it. It just means taking it away from Western Union. And it couldn't happen to a more deserving bunch of crooks. <laughs> Peer-to-peer -peer payments are the first step. The next step is peer-to-peer -peer lending. I am personally invested in Kiva and Lending Club with some of my money. Lending Club is a peer-to-peer -peer lending system that exists mostly here in the U.S. that allows people to get loans for cars and TVs and um, to uh, restructure their debt and things like that by getting funds from other individuals who want to invest directly in those loans. And by diversifying against thousands of lenders, you can essentially cut out the credit-making banks and allow people to extend credit to each other. Kiva does this on a global basis. So, for example, with a few thousand dollars, I've invested in more than 5,000 people around the world who use that money to restock their shop inventory in Kenya, to buy seeds for the next production in Tanzania, to buy a motorcycle as a taxi um, in, in Zimbabwe. And, and this is something you can all do, kiva.org, it's very easy. But Kiva is a centralized approach to doing this, and it's limited in its reach. We can redo this on a decentralized basis and provide peer-to-peer -peer lending where an individual in a developing world can actually source credit from thousands or tens of thousands of lenders from around the world. Do you really need a credit rating if you're giving someone a dollar? But you get 10,000 people to give a dollar and you've changed a community. And after peer-to-peer -peer lending, we can do peer-to-peer -peer crowdfunding. We can allow uh, organizations to do Kickstarter in a completely decentralized fashion, to raise funds to start new inno innovative businesses without a middleman, without the banks, just directly peer-to-peer, -peer, where individuals in the Bitcoin community can invest in the businesses around the world that they want to invest in directly, without regulations, without middlemen. So, peer-to-peer -peer payments, peer-to-peer -peer lending, peer-to-peer -peer crowdsourcing. Western Union, the big six banks, and all of the stock markets. And that's just the beginning. Bitcoin is the most disruptive thing that has happened at least in the last 20 years. And the great news is that by the, by the time they figure this out, they've already lost. I think they've already lost, and they haven't figured this out yet. Uh, if you watch the Senate hearings on Bitcoin, only one of the senators really grasped some of the disruptive effects and started asking questions about how this would affect the monetary policy of the Fed. All of the other ones were talking about whether there would be money laundering on this new payment network, completely missing the point. Um, I also like to address the issues of crime and money laundering on Bitcoin, because that's something that comes up often, and it's such a ridiculous issue. Uh, first of all, 
Out of the seven and a half billion people on this planet, how many of them are going to use Bitcoin for criminal purposes? And how many of them are going to use it to achieve personal empowerment? There are more of us than there are criminals. Secondly, the vast majority of crime happens on one currency, the US dollar, in cash, everywhere. If I manage somehow to buy a joint for Bitcoin on the Silk Road, I have added a tiny amount of Bitcoin to a pipeline that has been funded from planting to cultivation to distribution to processing to smuggling all the way until it reaches me. Right? And uh, I can't roll up a Bitcoin and use it to actually snort the drugs up my nose. <laughs> but you can do that with a dollar. <laughs> this is a distraction. And it's not an arbitrary distraction, it's a very deliberate distraction. distraction. On the internet, when we started using the internet, and I was on in 1989 as a teenager, but really got into it around 1991. I remember clearly the internet was not an engine of innovation and growth. The internet was a den of thieves, pornographers, and terrorists. <laughs> and that's exactly how it was portrayed by the media. And we were answering the exact same questions about the internet then, which was, what do you mean anyone can publish? What do you mean anyone can say anything without any controls? Society will implode. That's impossible. We can't do that. And so now we're having the same conversation. What do you mean people can send money anywhere in the world without controls? Well, guess what? That's how it's always been. The current experiment of fiat-based currencies that are not tied to any tangible goods, that are used to fund war, that are issued by central banks, with income taxation directly out of a worker's paycheck, is a 60-year failed experiment. We have the opportunity not to bank the other six billion, but to unbank all seven billion of us. We have the opportunity to allow the developing world to leapfrog directly from their current state of cash-based societies to digital cash societies and bypass the entire fiasco failed experiment of central currencies that we've experimented with in the Western world. And they're going to take this opportunity, just like they leapfrogged landlines and went directly to cell phones. In Africa, you see these one-foot square solar panels on huts. Huts that have no running water and no electricity. Huts that use wood to cook their food. And guess what that solar panel is doing? It's charging a Nokia R100 dumb phone. Because with that SMS connection, the person in that hut is connected to the world. They can find out the price of grain in Kinshasa without having to travel 40 miles. They can use M-Pesa, a global payment network based on cell phone minutes, to create 40% of the GDP in Kenya, completely bypassing the official currency. If we are able to simultaneously down-tech Bitcoin and up-tech the means of using it, we can allow the developing world to bypass uh, currency as we know it. So that's my vision. That's why I'm in Bitcoin. It's not my vision. It's the vision I got from talking to Bitcoin communities all around the world. And uh, so I'd like to wrap it up there and uh, take questions. So thank you very much.